So today we're here um, in a special build from Minecraft for Education that's available on all Minecraft um, devices. Like you can get it on the Xbox, you can get it on your tablet. Um, if you have Minecraft, you can download this world for free and it'll teach you everything you want to know about redstone. And redstone are like the um, Minecraft version of electrical circuits. So we're going to talk a little bit today about um, how electricity works and the differences between uh, electricity in the real world and how circuits work in Minecraft. So let's go ahead and get started. All right, so it says open this chest to begin. You should hear a voice when opening this. If not, please adjust your volume for maximum enjoyment. Welcome to Jig's Guide, Redstone Basics. My name's Jigarbov, and I'll be your guide. To begin your learning, head to the start posters and get yourself a minecart. Sit in it, and then press the button. Alright, here we go. You made it! Sometimes you'll have to push a button or pull a lever to continue. Everything you see here is powered by redstone. Redstone can be found as ore deep underground. You'll need an iron pick or better to mine it. Redstone can be used for so many things like doors, automatic farming systems, and even combination locks. Heck, even the animated characters right here in the mine are powered by redstone. Components next to redstone and blocks powered by redstone will activate. Check out the redstone lamps that turn on when the block of redstone is next to them or when they're powered by the redstone dust. You can even do stuff like ejecting players from minecarts with redstone. Now you see what power there is with redstone, step on the pressure plate sitting on the blocks of gold, and you're ready to begin the basics. Alright, here we go. So stepping on this, pre on this pressure plate unlocks the next room. Alright. Now the real fun begins. You unlock the basics. Head in there and learn how to use and play redstone power. Alright. These are pressure plates. When you stand on them, they emit redstone power and can activate redstone components like doors. For the sake of this tutorial, you can only place them on blocks of gold. Try it now. Alright, here's the block of gold. Let's see. You made it! When you see a block of gold, put a pressure plate right on it and see what it does. Hmm, here's another one. If you didn't already notice, redstone is able to do a lot of stuff. All of these components do something different when you step on your pressure plate. Pressure plates power components. They also power blocks themselves. Here you can see their range of power. Blocks adjacent to the powered block also have a range of power. Any component in this combined range will be powered as you can see with the redstone lamps. Climb up and step on the pressure plate to see. All right. Yeah, pretty cool. Wait, how is that door opening? The pressure plate is powering the redstone dust, which transmits the power to the door. I'm going to give you some levers now. For the sake of the tutorial, these can only be placed on blocks of diamond. Unlike the pressure plates, you can turn these on and leave them on. All right, let's try it. More stuff? Now you're getting some redstone dust. This can only be placed on red wool. Let's see if you can get through the door. Sure, this will open the door, but you probably can't make it to the door in time because it deactivates once you step off it. What about this side? Good idea, placing the lever on the block of diamond. Now all you have to do is complete the circuit. Alright, so 
this is a lot like circuits in the real world. So in the real world, so what you see here is called a Jamboard and it's from Google. So if you have a Gmail or an account, um, you can make one of your own and up there you can name it. So we're going to name it electrical circuits. There we go. And what you can do is you can draw right on it, which is very useful for things like this. So the first thing we're going to do to make our circuit, our real world circuit, is I'm going to find a picture of a battery. So we're going to go to a Google image search and look for battery. There we go. So we'll use this one. It's a good one. And we're going to select it, stick it in here. And let's move it, ooh, let's move it over a little bit. There we go. Now let's make it a tiny bit smaller by grabbing this edge. Perfect. All right. So electricity works in a circuit. And if you look at the word circuit, like right here, um, you'll notice the word that you can see part of the word circle. And that's a good way to think about circuits is that it goes in a circle. So the power is going to come out of the battery and also go back into the battery, completing the circle or the circuit. All right, so let's go ahead and draw what a very basic circuit would look like. The power would come out of the battery and maybe it would be used to light up, say, a light bulb. Don't laugh at my ugly light bulb. Um, the power go through the light bulb and then back into the battery. Now, more complicated switches would be something like, let's erase these guys. If we had a switch, such as when you turn on and off your light at home using a switch. So here comes out our power. Here's a nice little switch. I'm just gonna draw it like a little switch like that. Then we have the light bulb right here that we're gonna light up. And the power continues back on into the battery. So that's just a basic, very, very basic circuit. Now in Minecraft, um, your redstone circuits, their power only comes out one way and it doesn't have to go back into the circuit or into the battery. So if you think of a redstone torch or anything that powers redstone in Minecraft, um, if you think of it, as, of it as a battery, remember that batteries in the real world, the power goes out of and back into, but the battery type things in Minecraft, they only go in one direction. They never have to circle back into the power device. All right, let's try circuits here. This is the furthest that redstone can transmit full power without extra components. 15 blocks will only just make it to power the lamp at the end. Since the length of redstone dust is 16 here, it's too long to power the lamp. So you know that redstone power can only travel 15 blocks using redstone dust. That little grey thing right there is called a repeater. It will boost the power back up to 15 and allow it to transmit even further. All right, let's see if we can complete this circuit then. Connect it, connect it. There we go. Do we miss a spot? Oh, right there. Count it up. Using repeaters, the power traveled over 40 blocks. Nice. Oh, it's like a timer goes really slow with these ones.
Notice how long it took for the power to travel through all the repeaters? They can be adjusted to increase the delay of power through them. This shows how the repeaters boost the power back up to 15 strength each time. But of course, repeaters can only repeat if they take in a power level of at least one. Blocks of redstone transmit a constant power stream. They can never be turned off, so you don't have to worry about this door closing. Blocks mostly fall into two categories. Most opaque blocks are able to transmit power, whereas non-opaque blocks will not. Of course there are exceptions, try them all out or look in the test rooms for more examples later. This is a piston. When powered it will extend which pushes the block of redstone and then completes the circuit. Oh, here's another one. Pistons are unique in that they can draw power from redstone dust running next to them. Most components need the power to be pointed at them or at a block attached to them. Pistons will extend automatically if they are pushed against other power sources. Alfred! Alfred! Has anyone seen Alfred? Oh, hi everyone. My name is Jason Levy and I'm the music teacher from Campus International School. Have you seen Alfred? Oh, you probably don't know who Alfred is. So Alfred's my pet alligator and he's gone missing. So I'm hoping that I can find him and maybe you can help me find him today too. Because I have a song all about Alfred and I really need to find him. So let's go and maybe we can find him together. All right, sounds like a plan. Let's go. Alfred! Alfred! Mrs. Grizzlack, have you seen Alfred anywhere? No, I haven't seen Alfred. Have you seen Alfred? Mr. Johnson, have you seen Alfred? I haven't seen Alfred anywhere. Have you seen him? No. We don't know where he is. So I didn't have any luck finding Alfred, did you? Yeah, me neither. But I do have a song all about him, so you just listen the first time through and I'll sing it the first time. Have you ever been down the water spout to the very bottom of the water system? There you'll find a little alligator who goes by the name of Alfred. If you do, he's mine. I lost him. I threw him down the water spout and now I'm feeling lonely cause he's gone. I miss him. So this song does have a lot of words, so I'll do it one more time and you can just listen. Have you ever been down the water spout to the very bottom of the water system? There you'll find a little alligator who goes by the name of Alfred. If you do, he's mine. I lost him. I threw him down the water spout and now I'm feeling lonely cause he's gone. I miss him. So you can see the song has a lot of words. So let's break it up into little chunks and I'll sing a line and you echo after me and we'll slow the words down a little bit. One, here I go. Have you ever been down the water spout? Have you ever been down the water spout? To the very bottom of the water system. To the very bottom of the water system. Excellent job. There you'll find a little alligator. There you'll find a little alligator. Who goes by the name of Alfred? Who goes by the name of Alfred? If you do, he's mine. If you do, he's mine. 
So you can see that this song has a lot of words. So let's do this one more time, still echoing after me in these little chunks. One, here we go. Have you ever been down the water spout? Have you ever been down the water spout? To the very bottom of the water system. To the very bottom of the water system. There you'll find a little alligator. There you'll find a little alligator who goes by the name of Alfred. If you do, he's mine. Who goes by the name of Alfred. If you do, he's mine. Excellent job. So now let's take this into larger pieces and see if you can do it. Still echoing after me. Have you ever been down the water spout to the very bottom of the water system? Have you ever been down the water spout to the very bottom of the water system? Ooh, you guys are learning this quick. Now here's the next little part. There you'll find a little alligator who goes by the name of Alfred. If you do, he's mine. There you'll find a little alligator who goes by the name of Alfred. If you do, he's mine. Super great. So let's do this one more time this first section uh, all together. And I'll have the words here at the bottom of the screen to help us out. One, two, here we go. Have you ever been down the water spout to the very bottom of the water system? There you'll find a little alligator who goes by the name of Alfred. If you do, he's mine. Think you got that much? All right, put that up in your brain and now let's learn the last part. I lost him. I threw him down the water spout and now I'm feeling lonely cause he's gone. I miss him. So I'll sing a line, you echo after me. I lost him, I lost him. I threw him down the water spout. I threw him down the water spout and now I'm feeling lonely cause he's gone. And now I'm feeling lonely cause he's gone. I miss him. I miss him. Very, very good. So again, I'll sing a line, you echo after me. I lost him. I lost him. I threw him down the water spout. I threw him down the water spout. And now I'm feeling lonely cause he's gone. I miss him. And now I'm feeling lonely cause he's gone. I miss him. So now let's do this whole last section together. So let's sing it together. One, two, I lost him go. I lost him. I threw him down the water spout and now I'm feeling lonely cause he's gone. I miss him. Excellent job, you learned that so well. So now let's take the first part and attach it to the second part that we just did. One, two, here we go. Have you ever been down the water spout to the very bottom of the water system? There you'll find a little alligator who goes by the name of Alfred. If you do, he's mine. I lost him. I threw him down the water spout and now I'm feeling lonely cause he's gone. I miss him. Wow, you are such super singers. We're gonna do the song one more time, but this time we're gonna repeat it. And the first time through, we're gonna do it at the same speed that we've been doing it at, but the second time, we're gonna speed it up a little bit. So just make sure that you're listening really carefully and I think you'll be able to get it. And remember, the words will be underneath, so in case you get a little confused, you'll be able to find your way. And remember, if you make a mistake, it's not the end of the world. So let's try it together. One, two, here we go. Have you ever been down the water spout to the very bottom of the water system? There you'll find a little alligator who goes by the name of Alfred. If you do, he's mine. I lost him. I threw him down the water spout and now I'm feeling lonely cause he's gone. I miss him. Have you ever been down the water spout to the very bottom of the water system? There you'll find a little alligator who goes by the name of Alfred. If you do, he's mine. I lost him. 
I threw him down the water spout, and now I'm feeling lonely because he's gone. I miss him. Wow, that was fantastic. You are such great singers. So even though we couldn't find Alfred today, I'm glad that we were all able to learn a song about him. So if we ever do encounter an alligator at the bottom of the water spout, we'll know that it's probably Alfred. So again, my name is Jason Levy from Campus International School, and I can't wait to make more music with you again soon. Thanks. Bye. So does anybody have a clue as to why we were supposed to find this book, asked Kyle? He and his teammates were back in the young adult room staring at the cover of Get to Know Your Local Library. Too early to tell, said Miguel. Let's keep playing. This book will probably make more sense once we go into the other rooms and pick up more clues. Whose turn is it? asked Akimi. Yours, said Kyle. Flick the spinner. Akimi finger kicked the plaster, plastic pointer. Purple, she yelled when the arrow slid to a stop. The 800s. That means you move eight spaces, mumbled Kyle. Except today, Akimi reached for the card on top of the purple stack. When she saw what was written on it, she frowned. What's the clue, asked Kyle. Something about literature, rhetoric, or criticism, asked Miguel. Nope, said Akimi. It's a wild card with a riddle. Read it, said Sierra. I rhyme with Dart and Cracker Jacks. Visit me and fi uh, find a rhyme for Andy. Peckleman, said Kyle. How do you get his name on a game card? Bro, said Miguel. Nobody calls Andrew Peckleman Andy. Of course, it could mean Andrew Jackson, the seventh president of the United States. Or Andy Panda, said Akimi. Or Andrew Carnegie, said a Sierra. He was a generous supporter of libraries. Okay, said Kyle. Let's concentrate on the first part of the riddle. What rhymes with dart and cracker jacks? Smart and heart attacks, suggested Miguel. Art and bric-a-brac, said Sierra. Art and artifacts, said Akimi, nailing it. They hurried over to the art and artifacts room. Everybody, check out the display cases, said Kyle. See if anything rhymes with the word Andy. Well, this model of the old bake building is certainly grandy, said Miguel. And the Pharaoh's pyramid and sphinx would be sandy if they weren't made out of Legos. True, said Kyle sounding unconvinced about both. Check it out, you guys, cried Akimi, who was studying a row of styrofoam heads sporting mats, hats. This plain fedora from 1968 was warmed by a guy named Leopold Loblolly. So, said Kyle, according to this plaque, Loblolly was one of the notorious dandy bandits. Dandy rhymes with Andy. That it does, said Miguel. However, Loblolly does not. Neither does Leopold, added Kyle. Candy rhymes with Andy, said Sierra. She was staring at the objects in a display case under a banner reading, Welcome to the Wonderful World of Willy Wonka. Awesome, said Miguel, hurrying over to admire the collection of everlasting gobstoppers, glumptious glob gloppers, laffy taffy, and pixie sticks displayed under the glass in a sea of purple velvet. Mr. Milimanchello is a lot like Willy Wonka, said Kyle. You mean crazy, said Akimi? I prefer the term eccentric. And Dr. Zinchenko is his Oompa Loompa, said Sierra. Everybody started giggling. Nah, Kimi joked, she's too tall, and not nearly orange enough, added Miguel. The Willy Wonka book was written by Roald Dahl, said Sierra, who, Kyle figured, could name 12 other books the guy wrote, too. In it, Mr. Wonka takes Charlie and Grandpa Joe home in a flying glass elevator that crashes through the roof of his chocolate factory. Everybody thought about that for a second. So now we have to find a glass elevator, said Akimi, because there isn't one on the floor plan. But Mr. Lemoncello is just wild enough to build one, said Kyle. And if he did, he probably wouldn't put it on the floor plan. No way, said Miguel. Everybody would want to ride on it. I know I would, said Sierra. So we're seriously searching for a secret glass elevator, said Akimi. Maybe, said Kyle. Maybe not. This is just another piece of a gigantic jigsaw puzzle. We won't see the whole picture until we collect all the pieces. Or someone shows us the box, like cracked Akimi. Look, it's only 6 p.m., said Kyle, and we're collecting a ton of good information. You mean a ton of random information, said Akimi. Well, said Miguel, once we have more clues, we can use Sherlock Holmes' famous det deductive reasoning method to make logical connections between all the random junk. Works for me, said Kyle, but if we're going to play Sherlock Holmes, we need to go and spin that spinner and dig up more clues. The game's afoot, said a Sierra. Huh? Kyle and Akimi said together. Sorry, it's just something Sherlock says to Watson whenever he gets excited. Sherlock Holmes. Kyle had just found another bunch of books to add to his reading list. And it's kind of become a, a heated race between Kyle's team and Charles Chiltington. And things are starting to get heated, and a lot of people are starting to choose their teams. So it should be an interesting next few chapters. Alright, chapter 32. Okay, Sierra, said Kyle. Your turn. Sierra flicked the spinner. 
The pointy tip ended up in the yellow 200 zone, so she went ahead and pulled a yellow card. It's definitely for the 200 section, she said, showing her clue to Miguel before revealing it to Kyle and Akimi. Weird, said Miguel. What, said Akimi before Kyle could. Well, the 200s are where they keep books on world religions. But there are two numbers on this card, said Sierra. Maybe this time we need to find two books, suggested Kyle. I don't know, said Sierra, studying her card. 220.5203 is obviously a call number. Obviously, said Akimi. But this other number isn't in the proper format. 22015. February 20th, 2015, said Akimi. Quick, what happened on that date? Um, nobody knows, said Kyle, because it hasn't happened yet. Oh, right. Okay, how about February 20th, 1915? That was the opening day of the Panama Pacific International Exposition in San Francisco, said Sierra. Jaws dropped. Sorry, I'm a big World's Fair fan. Everyone else just nodded. Finally, Miguel spoke up. Look, let's just go down so we go down to the 200s room and find 220.5203. We can figure out the second chunk later. The team once again trooped down to the second floor and worked their way around the circular balcony. You guys, said Sierra, looking across the atrium at the statues, remember how they switched all the hologram authors when Bridget Wodge did her extreme challenge? Yep, said Kyle. She was still doing good. She was doing good till she got to the Russian dude. What Russian dude? asked Miguel, who hadn't witnessed Bridget's elimination. Guy who wrote five or six books Sierra could tell you about. But look, said Sierra, now all the other author's statues are the same ones they were last night. So, said Kyle thoughtfully, if they can switch them around... These must be clues for our game, blurted Akimi. She pulled out a pen and her notepad. I'll write down their names. Start with the guy under the triple zero's wedge of the Wonder Dome, suggested Kyle. Right. Akimi read the labeled pedestals and jotted down all the author names. Thomas Wolfe, Booker T. Washington, Stephen Sondheim, George Orwell, Lewis Carroll, Dr. Seuss, Maya Angelou, Shel Silverstein, Pseudonymous Bosch, Todd Strasser. So, said Akimi when she'd finished writing, do you think this game could get any more complicated? Maybe, said Kyle. It's possible that Mr. Lemoncello left a couple of different paths to the same solution. Well, personally, I can only take one path at a time, said Akimi, so let's go find 220 point whatever. Should be in the next row of bookcases, said Miguel. Here we go, 220.5203, the King James Bible. Ach, der Lieber, an excellent choice, said a man with a thick German accent. The four teammates spun around. And were face to face with a semi-transparent guy in medieval garb with a fur-trimmed cap and a beard... That looked like ooh, that looked like two raccoon tails sewn together under his nose and chin. I am Johannes Jenschfleisch zur Laden zum Gutenberg, said the holographic image, who had ink stains all over his fingertips. You created the Gutenberg Bibles on your printing press, Gus gushed Sierra. Yeah, 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 big bestseller. You need help with their Bible? I am at your service, he bowed. Oh, okay said Akimi, turning to Miguel. Take it away, Miguel. Air Gutenberg, sir, we're looking for 2-20-15th. Das ist einfach. Huh? That is easy. 2-20-15 is Exodus chapter 20, verse 15. Of course, said Miguel. Exodus is the second book of the Bible. 20 and 15 are the chapter and verse. He flipped through some pages. Here we go. Exodus chapter 20, verse 15. It's one of the Ten Commandments. Thou shalt not steal. 30. Let's put two new cards on the table, said Charles. He and his so-called teammates, Andrew and Haley. Charles planned on dumping them both right before he made his glorious solo exit from the library. Had scoured the library together for hours, looking for more book cover matches. Peckerman wasn't nearly as good with the Dewey Decimal System as he had claimed to be, and Charles needed someone to do that sort of thing for him. His father always hired tutors or research assistants for him wherever Charles had to do a major paper or report. Finally, around six in, coincidentally, the 600s room, they scored twice, finding T for you and me, 641.3372, and why wait to lose weight, 613.2522. Now their picture puzzle had only four blanks remaining. Here's the picture puzzle. 
Okay, said Andrew, I think it's pretty clear. Wooly blank, walk up the skinny blank blank, house Indian and 19 blank. Charles nodded and said, interesting. Even though he knew Peckelman was way off. Uh, hello, said Haley, that doesn't make any sense. Sure it does, said Andrew. Uh, no, it doesn't. In his head, Charles had decoded the clues so far as you, a female sheep, blank, walk out, the, T-H-E, way, blank, blank, in, in, past, past, blank. But out loud he said, I think we just need to tweak Andrew's translation a little. Fine, go ahead, I don't care. Andrew slumped down in his seat to sulk. How about she blank walks out the skinny blank blank house 500 and past blank? Where'd you get she? asked Haley. From sheep, the card you gave us. Actually, I think the sheep is supposed to represent you, because a you is a female sheep. Fascinating, said Charles. I didn't figure that out. What he did figure out was that Haley Daly was much smarter than he had assumed. She could be a serious threat, and no way was Charles sharing his prize with anybody, especially her. And how did you get 500 from Indiana, she asked. Simple. Indianapolis, the capital of Indiana, is home to a race known as the Indy 500. Okay, so how about you blank walk out the skinny blank blank inn, because the Nancy Drew book was about an inn, 500 pass or past blank. Now Peckelman piped up. That makes more sense than what you said, Charles. Indeed, said Charles, sounding magnanimous. Perhaps the clues are telling us to locate a secret skinny passageway 500 paces past some landmark here in the library. Andrew was excited. This is like the pirate map from Treasure Island. Or, said Haley, maybe these clues are telling us we need to go out and find the four books we haven't found yet. We should split up. I'll go back to the 400 room. We've already been there, said Andrew. Well, you guys might have missed something. Good idea, said Charles. He figured if Haley Daly wasted time retracing steps he and Andrew had already taken, she would find nothing new and become less of a threat. Let's meet back here at, say, 7? Fine. Haley left the meeting room. Charles went to the door and closed it. You know what we really need, he said to Andrews? Chocolate milk and maybe some cookies? Charles shook his head. No, Andrew. We need whatever clues Kyle Keeley and his team have found, especially if they have our missing cards. Uh oh. Kyle's in for some trouble, it looks like. Chapter 34. Veering left the instant she reached the second floor, Haley made her way toward the 400s room. She figured that Charles and Andrew had probably missed something important in the foreign languages room because they'd spent too much time talking to these awesome mannequins that told them all about their American heritage. As she rounded the bend, Haley saw Kyle Keeley and his crew tumble out of the 200s room. It looked like Miguel was carrying a Bible, but a Bible wasn't one of the books on display in the staff picks case. We're following separate paths to the same goal, Haley thought, and somewhere those two paths are going to collide. Haley slid her card key down the reader slot in the 400 store. The Glock clicked and she pushed the door open. The room was dimly lit. Bienvenida, bienvenu, Witami, Kowaka Rubri Risha, welcome, boomed a voice from the ceiling speakers. Sorry, said Haley, blindly feeling her way forward and bumping into something hard and lumpy. This is the 400 room, home of foreign languages. Here, Haley, you can learn all about your American heritage. A bank of spotlights thumped on. Haley was basically hugging a department store mannequin. An overhead projector beamed a movie onto the dummy, to her left, turning it into a perky woman who looked like Haley would probably look a couple of years after she graduated from college. Hello, Haley. Welcome to your American heritage. Let's begin your voyage. That's okay. I don't have time right now. I'm Haley Daly. My ancestors were Irish, okay? So can we skip the history lesson and... Suddenly, the two mannequins at the far end of the row turned into sepia-toned versions of her great-great-great-grandmother and great-great-great-grandfather. Haley knew it was them because her dad had a bunch of old photos hanging in their living room. The two dummies looked exactly like Patrick and Una Daly did in their wedding portrait. No man ever wore a scarf as warm as his daughter's arm around his neck, said Patrick in his thick Irish brogue. Your dad's proud of you, Haley. Thanks, but I really need to win this competition. Watch out for sneaky rascals, said Una. Them that would steal the sugar out of your punch. Haley had to smile. It sounded like her ancestor had met Charles Chiltington. And always remember, Haley, said her great-great-great-grandfather, every woman's mind is her kingdom. Rule it wisely, lassie. 
I'm trying. This library can help, said her great-great-grandmother with a wink. And when she did, a secret panel in the wall slid open. What's going on, said Haley. You're our third visitor, boomed the jelly announcer in the ceiling. So, according to the American Heritage Dictionary of Idioms, available in our reference department, by the way, the third time is a charm. Therefore, as our third visitor, you have won this charming bonus. Two bonuses in one day? She was right. Mr. Lemonchello definitely wanted Haley Daly to win this game, because clearly he knew she'd be the perfect best-looking spokesmodel for his holiday commercials. Don't worry, sir, Haley said to the nearest TV camera. I won't let you down. She hurried through the open wall panel and into the 300 room on the other side. Ta-da! The first thing she saw was one of the books they'd been searching for all day long. True Crime Ohio, the Buckeye State's Most Notorious Brigands, Burglars, and Bandits, by Claire Taylor Winters. She quickly opened the cover and found the hidden 4x4 card. It took her two seconds to decipher the clue. It looks like a band walking and it's... Bandits! Hayla remembered another bit of Irish wisdom, something her dad said all the time. Never bolt your door with a boiled carrot. She decided to keep this new clue secret and secure. She wouldn't share it with Charles or Andrew. Haley took off her left sneaker, folded the card in half, and slid the clue into her shoe for safekeeping. When her sneaker was laced up tight again, she took up the True Crime Ohio book off its display stand and tucked it into the bookshelf, making sure it was in the proper position, right between 364.1091 and 364.1093. That way, she'd know where to look again if, for whatever reason, she needed the book again. Haley looked up at the nearest camera and flashed at her brightest toothpaste commercial smile. Go Lemoncello, that's a cheer I just made up. We can use it in one of the commercials, after I win. Sounds like Haley Daly is feeling pretty sure of herself. Chapter 35 Entrance to Community Meeting Room B will only be granted to Kyle Keeley, Sierra Russell, Akimi Hughes, and Miguel Fernandez said the soothing female voice in the ceiling after the four teammates had swiped their card through the meeting room door's reader slot. This makes sense, said Akimi. We needed a place to organize all this material, put it on the walls, and draw a chart like the FBI does, always does on the TV when they're tailing the mob. Stole the meeting room idea from me, eh, Keeley? Charles Chiltington was standing in the doorway to meeting room A on the far side of the rotunda. No, said Kyle, we just needed some place to throw our victory party after we win. Not going to happen, Charles said smugly. Must I remind you, I'm a Chiltington, we never lose. And he disappeared back into meeting room A. After Charles was gone, Kyle led his team into meeting room B. Miguel posted the bank blueprints he had found up on the walls while Sierra set up the Bibliomania game board on the conference table. I'm glad this room won't let anybody else in, said Kyle. And by anybody, you mean Charles Chiltington, right? said Akimi. Totally. Akimi grabbed a marker and wrote a neat outline on the dry erase walls. Clues so far. Definite clues. Number one, from the hundreds room, from the zeros room, get to know your local library book. Number two, from the art and artifacts room, Willy Wonka candy, rhymes with Andy, find glass elevator. Number three, from the two hundreds room, Bible verse, thou shalt not steal. Probably clues. Books slash authors on the backs of library cards. Number one, Miguel Fernandez, Incident at Hawks Hill by Alan W. Eckert. No David by David Shannon. Number two, Akimi Hughes, One Fish, Two Fish, Red Fish, Blue Fish by Dr. Seuss slash Nine Stories by J.D. Salinger. Number three, Unknown. Number four, Bridget Watch, Tales of a Fourth Grade Nothing by Judy Bloom. Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone by J.K. Rowling. Number five, Sierra Russell. The Egypt Game by Zilpha Keatley Snyder. The Westing Game by Ellen Raskin. Number six, Yasmin Smith Snyder. Around the World in 80 Days by Jules Verne. The Yak Who Yelled Yuck by Car Carol Pugliano Martin. Number seven, Sean Keegan. Olivia by Ian Falconer. Unreal by Paul Jennings. Number eight, Unknown. Number 9, Rose Vermette, All of a Kind Family by Sidney Taylor, Scat by Carl Hyacin. Number 10, Kayla Corson, Anna to the Infinite Power by Mildred Ames, 
Where the Sidewalk Ends by Shel Silverstein. Number 11, Unknown. Number 12, Kyle Keeley, I Love You Stinky Face by Lisa McCourt. The Napping House by Audrey Wood. Maybe clues? Statues ringed around the dome. Thomas Wolfe, Booker T. Washington, Stephen Sondheim, George Orwell, Lewis Carroll, Dr. Seuss, Maya Angelou, Shel Silverstein, Pseudonymous Bosch, oh, and Todd Strasser. Um... Statues ringed around the dome. Thomas Wolfe, Booker T. Washington, Stephen Sondheim, George Orwell, Lewis Carroll, Dr. Seuss, Maya Angelou, Shel Silverstein, Pseudonymous Bosch, Todd Strasser. Wow, said Akimi, stepping back to study the walls. What an incredible mess. Yeah, said Kyle. Okay, guys, there are eight more book rooms to explore, and who knows how many more wild cards. Whose turn is it? Yours, said Sierra. Kyle flicked the spinner. Green, the 500s, science. He pulled the first green card from the deck. Four and 20 were once in a pie. 598.367 might tell you why. Blackbird, said Miguel? I guess. Well, sighed Akimi, let's go check out another book. There's still like an inch or two left on our whiteboard. The 500's room was like a miniature museum of natural history. In addition to towering walls of books, there was a whole planetarium of stars and constellations projected on the ceiling. Models of planets whirled in their orbits, sparkle-tailed comets shot around the corners of bookshelves. Kyle and his teammates made their way back to the 590's, zoology. Shelving units were arranged in a square around an open area, maybe 20 feet by 20 feet wide. When the team entered the empty space, the lights dimmed and a guy with long wavy hair who looked like an artistic Daniel Boone faded into view. He was wearing some kind of bear fur coat and toting a musket. Bonjour, said the hologram. It's John James Audubon, said Sierra, the famous ornithologist. He gives people braces, said Kyle. <laughs> no, said Sierra said with a laugh. He studied and painted birds. A blackbird with a yellow beak flew into the open area and roosted on a tree branch. The bird and the tree were both holograms too. This beautiful blackbird from Alexandriaville, Ohio, said the semi-transparent Audubon image, can mimic in song the sounds it has heard. And the bird started wailing. Wow, said Akimi, that sounds exactly like a police siren. Yo, said Miguel, freaky. To learn more, said Audubon, be sure to read Bird Songs, Warbles, and Whistles, written by Dr. Diana Victoria Garcia, with classic illustrations by moi. With that, Audubon sat down on a camp stool. An easel appeared. The blackbird struck a pose, and the outdoorsy artist started painting the bird's portrait while humming Blackbird by the Beatles. Okay, said Kyle, this is the strangest clue yet. Well, here's the book, at least, said Sierra, who had found 598.367 on the shelf. So what do a blackbird's wails and warbles have to do with finding your way out of the library, said Akimi. Just then, they heard a very different sound. Behind one of the bookcases, something growled, then roared. Did you guys hear that, said Sierra? Yeah, said Akimi. I don't think it's a robin redbreast. A very rare white Bengal tiger with icy blue eyeballs crept out from behind a wall of bookshelves and stalked into the open area where Audubon sat painting his bird portrait. Uh, is that another hologram? asked Miguel. Roar! No one stuck around to find out. Chapter 36 Down on the first floor, Charles and Andrew working, were working their way around the semicircle of three-story tall Florida Dome bookcases filled with fiction. It was nearly 8 p.m. We need to find that blasted book, said Charles, craning his head to study the bookshelves. I'm getting kind of hungry, mumbled Andrew. We had a snack this afternoon, snapped Charles. Well, now it's time for dinner. No, we need to find Anne of Green Gables first. The classic by Lucy Maud Montgomery was the middle book on the top shelf in the Staff Picks display case. So far, Charles, Haley, and Andrew had not been able to find it anywhere in the library. Unfortunately, said Andrew, they've temporarily erased the book's call number from the database. So we wouldn't know what to punch into the hover ladder's control panel, grumbled Charles. Actually, said Andrew, they might have shelved it in the children's room, or maybe the 800s with literature. Could be in the 400s too, because it was originally written in Canadian, which is technically a foreign language. So you have said, Andrew, repeatedly, 
but we've already searched those other locations several times. It has to be here with the other fiction titles. You just need to fly up and find it. Well, said Andrew, I'm kind of afraid of heights. Fine, whatever. I'll go up and grab it, but you have to give me some kind of call number to enter into the hover ladder. Lucy Maud Montgomery wrote other Anne books. There's Anne of Avonlea. Charles dashed over to the nearest library table and swiped his fingers across the glass face of its built-in computer pad. Here we go. Anne of Avonlea by Lucy Maud Montgomery. F. Mon. Yes, said Andrew. Fiction books are usually put on the shelf in alphabetical order by the author's last name. Nonfiction titles are classified according to the Dewey Decimal System. How long have you known this? Andrew's nose twitched. Since second grade? So all we ever needed was F. Mon? We could have found this book hours ago? Andrew gulped. You are such a disappointment. Shaking his head, Charles huffed over to one of the hover ladders. He quickly jabbed F, M, O, and N into the keypad. The boot clamps locked into place around his ankles. You owe me for wasting all this time, Andrew. You owe me big time. If you let me down once more, I swear I will tell. Everybody, you're a big blubbering baby. I'll Twitter it and post it on Facebook. Don't worry. I'll make you glad you picked me for your team, Charles. I promise. The hover, offer, uh, hover ladder lifted off the floor and gently glided up to the M section of the fiction wall. Shuttling sideways, it carried Charles over to a shelf displaying all the Anne books. He grabbed a copy of Anne of Green Gables. As soon as he did, the ladder started its slow descent to the floor. What'd you find? asked Andrew when Charles landed. The clue we needed. He showed Andrew the card that had been tucked inside the front cover. C plus, and that's a picture of Anne of Green Gables from the cover. Okay, said Andrew, it's C plus hat. So the word is chat, which by the way, could also be shot, the French word for cat. Well done, Andrew, said Charles, even though he knew the clue was really C plus an equaling can, thereby making the puzzle, you can walk out the way blank blank in in past blank. The way what did what, he wondered, and what does in in mean? Charles desperately needed to find the three missing pictograms. Suddenly, Mr. Lemoncello's voice boomed out of speakers ringing the rotunda. Hey, Charles! Hey, Andrew! Let's do a deal! Game show music blared. A canned crowd cheered. Charles turned around and saw shafts of colored light illuminating three envelopes perched on top of the librarian's round desk. Clarence, the security guard, marched into the reading room and, folding his arms over his chest, took up a position near the three envelopes. We have a green envelope, a blue envelope, and a red envelope, said Mr. Lemoncello. In two of those three envelopes are copies of two of the three pictogram clues you still need. In one, there is a clunker card. If you pick an envelope with a clue, you get to keep it, and you get to keep going. But once you pick the clunker card, you're done, and you must suffer the consequences. Andrew raised his hand. Yes, Andrew? What are the consequences? Something bad, said Mr. Lemoncello. In fact, something wicked this way will probably come. Do you want to do a deal? Yes, said Charles. The canned audience cheered. All right then, Charles. You roll first. Pardon? Swipe your fingers across the nearest desktop computer panel. The Dice Tumblr app is up and running. Again, the pre-recorded audience cheered. They sounded like they loved watching Dice Tumble more than anything in the world. Charles slid his fingers across a glass pane. The animated dice rolled. Oh, cried Mr. Lemoncello, double sixes. That gives you a twelve. Is that good, sir? Maybe, maybe not. Okay, Andrew, your turn. Peckleman tapped the glass. The dice flipped over. Another set of doubles, said Mr. Lemoncello. Yeah, muttered Charles. Two ones, snake eyes. Is that bad, asked Andrew. Maybe, said Mr. Lemoncello, maybe not. Okay, guys, which envelope would you like to open? Charles thought it while TikTok music played. They were given this chance to play Let's Do a Deal after they located the Anne of Green Gables clue. Coincidence? He didn't think so. We'll take the green envelope, sir. Clarence presented the green envelope to Charles. Open it, said Andrew, open it. Charles undid the clasp and pulled out a card. A loud zonk rocked the room. The card was blank with blocky white type. Uh-oh, mumbled Andrew. What's it say on that card? 
Sorry, kids, you're out of luck, Red Charles. So out of doors, you're all now stuck. Clarence picked up the blue and red envelopes and marched back towards the entrance hall. What's that mean, said Andrew? Well, said Mr. Lemoncello, Charles rolled a 12, and you rolled a 2. What's 12 plus 2? 14, said Charles eagerly, the way he always did in math when he wanted to remind the teacher that he was the smartest kid in class. Oh, said Mr. Lemonchel, that is not good. In fact, I'd say it's stinkerific. Stinkerific, said Andrew. Is that even a word? It is now, said Mr. Lemoncello. JJ, tell them what they've lost. An authoritative female voice boomed out of the ceiling speakers. Warning, due to a clunker card, all ten Dewey Decimal doors will lock in ten minutes at exactly eight o'clock. If you are in one of those rooms, kindly leave immediately. The ten doors on the second floor will remain locked for fourteen hours. Andrew panicked. What? Fourteen hours? I told you twelve plus two was bad, quipped Mr. Lemoncello. Of course, it could have been good. If you had picked one of the other envelopes, you would have received a clue and a free fourteen months subscription to Library Journal. Charles did some quick math. Sir, does this mean we'll be locked out of the ten Dewey decimal, decimal rooms until ten o'clock tomorrow morning? Bingo, said Mr. Lemoncello. It sure does. This stinks, whined Andrew. We need those stupid rooms to solve your stupid puzzle. Clunker cards stink. This game stinks. Fourteen-hour penalties stink. Charles did his best to block out Andrew's rant. He needed to think, and then it hit him. Kyle's Keeley's team had to be working on some other solution to the bigger puzzle of how to escape from the library. Otherwise, Charles and his team would not have been able to find the nine clues they'd already picked up. Surely, if Keeley's team had been playing the same memory match game, they would have found at least one of the pictograms before Charles, Andrew, or Haley did. They must be working on a completely different angle. Charles was certain that if he could use this downtime to learn what Keeley and his team had in their meeting room and combined it with his picture puzzle, he would emerge from the library victorious. Do not despair, Andrews, Charles said confidently. We are still going to win. How? Charles leaned in and cupped a hand around his mouth so no security cameras could read his lips. Remember, he whispered, you need to pay me back for wasting a ton of time in finding Anne of Green Gables. What? You're the one who picked the stupid green envelope with the stupid clunker card. Charles narrowed his eyes and chilled his hushed voice. So? Um, nothing, said Andrew nervously. Just thought I'd, you know, point it out. Charles turned his eyes eyes into blue ice. So, whispered Andrew, swallowing hard, what exactly do you want me to do? Find a way to sneak into community meeting room B. Andrew wheezed in panic. That's impossible. Don't worry, I have an idea. What is it? Two words. Sierra Russell. Chapter 37. Ever wonder if this could wreak any worse, said Akimi, because it couldn't. Yo, none of us pulled a pu none of us pulled a clunker card, groused Miguel. That means somebody on Charles' team did it. Akimi and Miguel are right, Kyle, said Sierra. This really isn't fair. I know, was all Kyle could say, but it's like in Mr. Lemoncello's family frenzy, where one player pulls the orthodontist card and everybody has to move back seven spaces to buy their kids braces. Kyle and his teammates were back in community reading room B. They'd been staring at the clue board, wondering what a wailing blackboard had to do with Willy Wonka and the Ten Commandments, not to mention that long list of books and all the statues, when the voice in the ceiling made its announcement about the Dewey Decimal doors being locked for 14 hours. Well, Mr. Lemoncello better have a good reason, said Akimi. Oh, I do, said Mr. Lemoncello. His face appeared on one of the meeting room walls, which was really a giant plasma screen video monitor. Team Kyle is not being penalized for Team Charles' blunder. He said far from it. In fact, you are being rewarded. Akimi arched her eyebrows in disbelief. Really? How? The other team's penalty gives you a wrinkle in time. A wrinkle in time, said Kyle. Is that a clue? No, it's a book. And sometimes, Kyle, a book is just a book. But thanks to the clunker card, you have the gift of wrinkled time to seek clues outside the ten de Dewey Decimal rooms. Speaking of time, a magazine available in our periodical section, it's dinner time. So the game is basically suspended until 10 o'clock tomorrow, said Kyle? Well, Kyle, that's up to you. You can use this time as a bonus to think, read, and explore. Or you can run upstairs and play video games all night long. The choice is yours. We want to win this game, said Kyle. His teammates nodded in agreement. Wonder, Miss said Lemoncello. Said Mr. Lemoncello, keep working the puzzle, but try to avoid Mrs. Basil E. Frankenweiler's files. They're all mixed up. 
And before you turn in this evening, you might want to spend some time curled up with a good book. Um, they just said the book rooms are locked, said Akimi. The nice lady in the ceiling was only talking about the ten Dewey Decimal Rooms. There is plenty of first-class fiction in the Rotunda Reading Room. Dr. Zinchenko has even selected seven books specifically for our seven remaining contestants. After dinner, you'll find those books on her desk. When he said that, Mr. Lemonchel started winking. I think you'll find the books to be very enlightening, inspirational even. And then he winked some more. And now I must return to my side of the mountain. See you in the morning, children. I have great expectations for you all. Mr. Lemoncello's image disappeared from the wall. Okay, said Akimi. From the way Mr. Lemoncello was just winking, either somebody kicked a bucket of sand in his face, or our recommended reading list is another clue. On the other side of the rotunda, Charles huddled with Andrew in meeting room A. I don't trust Haley, he said. Why not? Charles placed his hand on Andrew's shoulder. Well, my friend, I'm not sure if I should tell you this, but Haley told me she didn't think you were handsome enough to appear in Mr. Lemoncello's holiday commercials with us when we win. Because of my glasses? Charles bit his lip, nodded. Of course, I totally disagree. I see, said Andrew, his ears burning bright red. Then she doesn't get to see what we found in that Anne of Green Gables book. Very well, Andrew, if that's how you want to play it. You bet I do. Fine, let's go see what's for dinner. I'm starving. When Charles and Andrew entered the cafe, the Keeley team was already inside, filling their trays. Hey, way to go, Charles, joked Miguel Fernandez. You guys pulled a clunker card? Indeed we did. However, not even that bit of bad luck can derail our juggernaut. Huh? said Akimi. He means we're still going to win, said Andrew. Charles and Andrew crossed the far side of the room to join Haley, who was sitting in a corner. You guys find any clues this afternoon, she asked? Sadly, no, said Charles. All we found was that door-locking penalty, said Andrew, who could lie almost as well as Charles. How about you, Haley? Charles asked. Find anything interesting? Nope, nada. Then she yawned and finished her dinner. I think I'll head upstairs and sack out. Really? It's only 8.48. I know, but I'm totally pooped. She yawned again. Plus, I want to be up bright and early before the Dewey Decimal doors reopen. We have more clues to find. See you guys tomorrow. Unless we have more teen business to discuss? Nope, nothing. She walked out of the cafe. I am. I am. I am. Yo soy. I am Cleveland Public Schools.